at number 10 is Ash Bath. Just saying medieval times doesn't actually mean much. Every empire and kingdom had its own respective medieval time at different times than one another. So Persia spanned from the 6th century to the 15th century, during which time they concocted some truly heinous punishments for those who did wrong, or at least those who did wrong in the eyes of whatever crazy leader was in charge at the time. Setting the stage for long suffering death everywhere, Persia introduced such styles as forcing people to drink molten gold, tearing people apart with trees, and drowning them in ash. This punishment was one of the worst deaths you could receive, reserved for the worst criminals and those guilty of high treason or offenses against the gods. And it was horrifying. It consisted of throwing a victim into a 75 foot tower filled with ashes. You'd break a couple of bones, but it was a soft landing. From outside the tower, large hand cranks were spun by a team of men, sending the ashes flying and disrupting the solid pile so that the victim was pushed deeper and deeper down the tower, suffocating on burnt ash until they drowned in it. If you've dipped your toes in the Bible, you may know there's quite a few people that got this sentence in there, such as a corrupt Jewish priest whose family isn't allowed to bury his remains with a bunch of sassy snaps added. However, the concubines caught planning coups against their leader on several occasions met this fate too. Punishment number nine is the evil field. So medieval Rome is characterized by the break with Constantinople and the formation of the papal state, with technically ongoing until its collapse, which marks the beginning of Europe's medieval period. On the topic of being buried while still breathing, the Romans also enjoyed dumping people into holes alive in their medieval times. One famous example is the Vestal Virgins, the priestesses of the hearth goddess Vesta who were sworn to chastity. However, should they break that chastity vow, they had a special acre of grass dead dedicated just to burying them alive. Like most deaths, Romans like to make a big show of it, and the Vestal breaking her virginity vow would naturally be the Sunday matinee. They had an entire little ritual. She'd be carried on a litter throughout the city in the nude until they reached the Campus Seculoratus, aka the evil field. There, an underground chamber awaited in which she'd be lowered into and sealed inside alive. There was only one ever known instance in Roman history where a Vestal virgin wasn't slain for breaking her vows. That would be Julia Achilia Severa. The wife, then ex-wife, then wife again, of Emperor Elagabalus. It's believed that Julia remained with him until they were killed in the year 222, but who's to say they put Julia in the ground after. Punishment number eight is the finger cinch. China's medieval period was between the fall of the Han Dynasty in 220 CE and the fall of the Mongol Dynasty in 1368 CE. Famous in the Chinese feudal dynasty, this form of punishment was specifically made for the woman who did not obey her master's command. Master can be taken literally, should it be a concubine or a servant, but also figuratively like her parents or husband. The offenders have to put their fingers inside a specialized tool which look like interlocking combs. The device would then squeeze the fingertips, causing immense pain and loss of circulation. If the victim faints, ice water would be thrown on her as a wake-up call. The punishment would continue until the victim was deprived of all their strength. The device was prepared in every shape and size to crush the fingers of any female, so she may ultimately surrender to male prejudice. Punishment number seven is the four witnesses. The Ottoman Empire was born very, very shortly, around 100 years at most, before the European medieval period started. As stated, it began when Rome broke from Constantinople, and thus it finished alongside the other European nations in the 16th century. How they punish adultery is akin to many cultures. Man cheats, no punishment. Woman cheats, world must be ending. The Ottoman criminal code did not distinguish between fornication and adultery. Xena was the word used for both, and both were unacceptable from a woman of any kind. And when caught in an alleged act of Xena, in order to ensure the women were not wrongfully accused, the accuser is required to produce four witnesses of good standing that actually observed the act of intercourse as it was happening. Imagine that, you walk in on your wife in bed with your best friend, so you have to run yelling into the streets for four people to come right now and see them while they're still hurriedly dressing so you have some chance of getting her punished. However, even if you do manage to pull off four witnesses, if the witnesses can't be found at the time of the woman's trial, then the accusing husband will be flogged 80 stripes and ignored. So what I'm hearing is as a cheating wife, you could essentially make the little problem go away if these four witnesses were to, I don't know, just casually disappear before the court day. However, on a terrifying note, the husband's second option when calling the four witnesses to his house is taking justice into his own hands. He can actually just kill his wife on the spot and face no punishment, nor require going to court, even if the witnesses didn't see the wife cheating beforehand. Punishment number six is marks and tattoos. European medieval period started with the fall of Rome in 476 AD and extended to roughly 1450. Meanwhile, a fun fact, the 
Americas never experienced a medieval period because a feudal system was never actually established in that hemisphere. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, protagonist Hester Prynne is marked with a red A to see her as an adulterer. This was practiced in a few regions of medieval Europe, such as Spain, France, even Britain. However, it was reserved for working girls and their keepers and continued well out of the medieval period until the Achaean regime. Women who committed the crime of puritanism were branded with hot iron to show the world how frivolous they are. What The working girls received a P on the arm, the booty, or the forehead, which I feel is a bit vindictive and personal. Meanwhile, the keepers were branded with an M, accompanied by a fleur-de-lis. King Charles IV even made them outlaws, stating that may all girls of joy and public women desolate from our court in said time under pain of whip and mark. After the establishment of the New World, which is out of the medieval period, but as stated, the Americas didn't have one, we see branding laws and colonies more akin to Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, such as the 1658 Plymouth Law that stated adulterers must mark every garment they own to identify them of their crime. Adulterers seen publicly without their letters were subjected to public whipping and further humiliation. Punishment number five is just gross. The medieval and feudal periods of Japan, they hold hands on this one, stretched from 1185 to 1603 CE, and they easily had one of the most disgusting punishments I've heard of for female adultery, suspected or confirmed. It existed from the 12th to the 9th century Japan, however, it was more so practiced in remote villages. A wife accused of adultery was punished by a defacing, and this defacing was done by C, exactly the type of seed you're thinking. So I'm going to be talking around the subject due to a graphic nature. If a husband suspected that his wife had been unfaithful, he and his friends would take her to a remote area where she'd be restrained and the men would take turns standing above her and deface her. When the adultery isn't suspected but actually caught and confirmed, the adulteress would be led through the village naked before tied up in the center on her knees. Paper screens would be set up around her so that the men in the village who were urged to participate in this horrific act of public shaming may have privacy while they deface her. The screens only protected the men from indecency. The adulteress would remain exposed for the public to see what was happening to her. Punishment number four is working girl. Hard to follow up that last one with anything worse or more gross, but the medieval Japan had an eye for an eye judicial system that balanced crime and punishment. Japan had no gender bias and crimes done by women were not punished lightly, the way counterparts in Europe or China would have. Equal punishments were imposed for the same crime no matter the gender. So it's a bit strange that arsonists would be burnt at the stake, thieves have their hands cut off, liars lost their tongues and ears, but women committed a petty crime and was sentenced to work time duration as a working girl, which arguably is not even close to payment in kind. Additionally, a woman could have her head shaved as punishment for her crime. In larger empires, this was often the punishment for adultery, which is far better off than the one in the villages. The husband would also be granted an automatic divorce from his now bald and weepy ex-wife. Since punishment was equal, a man got his head shaved too, had to repay dowry, and get publicly shamed, right? No, and his wife wasn't allowed to leave him for it either. Punishment number three is scoffism. Back in the medieval Persia, this punishment was death by being eaten alive. It had taken place in a swamp or somewhere where the boats, which would be two canoe-like boats or one hollowed out tree, could lie exposed to the sun. The victim would be tied inside the space with their head, hands, and feet exposed to possible. At which point, the victim is force-fed honey and milk. This is a messy process. It'll splatter and spill everywhere. However, whatever the victim does swallow, inevitably becomes diarrhea. The idea was that this would attract every insect, vermin, and wild animal in the area. Very soon afterwards, flies and rats, for instance, would show up and start attacking the victim, eating the mixture of milk and honey, but also eating the person alive in the process. Once the diarrhea kicks in, it attracts other animals, especially the rats, who will begin feasting on you as well and sometimes enter you. Death usually came from septic shock or gangrene because the victim would be force-fed this honey and milk every day until they died, meaning dehydration was no issue. Religious just fallacy, coup attempts, and adultery were all punished in this horrific manner and many women suffered this end. Punishment number two is wooden horse. This device was used in Europe and Japan in the 14th to 18th centuries, making it predominant in medieval Europe. Initially, the horse was used on women accused of heresy and witchcraft. The Spanish particularly loved this crude device and they invented it. Sometimes they even styled it to look like a horse. Its back was a triangular wedge women were forced to sit on as weights around their ankles dragged them 
and their rear and hoo-ha area down on the sharpened wedge. It was covered in part one of this video. In Japan, however, they added another particularly horrific element that was not meant to just cause some external tears and pelvic fractures the way the Europeans did, rather cause mass hemorrhaging and death. The concept is the same, wooden horse with a wedge that you'd be forced to straddle while your legs are pulled down. However, the Japanese added an appendage-like structure on the horse's back, which the woman was forced to sit on. The appendage had the appendage was studded with iron nails and could be rotated via a hand crank from beneath. Naturally, this would cause almost immediate heavy bleeding and internal damage before the crank was even turned. Many would die miserably and quickly, whereas the ones who somehow survived often only did with paralysis. This form of punishment was served on basic offenses, such as adultery or unpleasing her husband. Punishment number one is the chest tax. Imagine taxing someone for what's on their chest. Now imagine taxing someone for what's on their chest chest and for them trying to cover it. Over in India, this was a reality imposed by the king of the erstwhile state of Travancore, one of the 550 princely states that existed in British-ruled India. The chest tax was imposed on lower class women if they covered their chest in public and it was to discourage them from doing so. The purpose of this tax was to maintain caste structure, said Dr. Shiva K.M., an associate professor of gender ecology. Social customs on clothing were tailored to a person's caste status, which meant that they could be identified by merely how they dressed. The village legend of Nangali is about a woman who supposedly cut off her girls in an effort to protest against the caste-based chest tax. Nangali belonged to the Abhava caste. Her community was required to pay the tax alongside many other lower castes, but villagers say she decided to protest by covering her chest without paying the chest tax. When the tax inspector heard she was refusing to pay the tax, he went to her house to ask her to stop breaking the law. She still refused and instead cut her girls off her chest in protest instead and presented them to the tax collector in a plantain leaf. According to the local villagers, Nangali died of excessive blood loss while her distraught husband took his life by jumping on her funeral pyre. Her act was selfless and a sacrifice that benefited all the women of Travancore and ultimately forced the king to roll back the chest tax. The chest tax caught wider attention in 2016 when BBC reported Divya Arya reported on a series of paintings by artist Morali T, a far distant relative on the legend of Nangali. He was so moved by the story and the absence of any visual documentation, he decided to paint a likeness of the act she brought upon herself. I did not want it to depict it as a bloody event. Instead, my aim was to glorify her act as an inspiration to humanity, a representation of what would command respect. You're better off without them, apparently. Number 10 in the countdown. The Christian view of women in ancient Roman society came in and, like the religion itself, quashed the pagan beliefs preceding them. Pagan times in Rome weren't a merry old good time for women, don't get me wrong, but they had more rights and respect when there was a whole pantheon of women gods whose tempers were to be revered and feared by every Roman man. But then they convert and answer to one god who was depicted as a soul man, making it, pun intended, a man's world. In the 4th century AD, the Andrew Tate of ancient Rome, Saint Jerome, set the standard on how you should perceive and treat women around you. If your wife has a bad temper, or if she's stupid, or if she has a birthmark, or if she's haughty, or if she has a foul breath, you'll only learn these things after marriage. You always have to tell her how beautiful she looks. If you so much as look at another woman, she feels rejected. Rejected. You have to bow down before her and call her my lady, and you mustn't forget her birthday. It's worse if she's pretty than if she's ugly, because then you have to constantly be on your guard. Honestly, try and tell me you can't picture some old Roman bald dude in a toga, like white beard, one of those stupid teak tables, wearing the oversized podcast headphones, saying that exact tirade while like Joe Rogan is sitting across from nodding, like, yeah, man, yeah, that's what's up. Hey, dude, kind of makes sense that you're only gonna find out about her personality after you married her when y'all don't even even know each other when you get married and you bought her at a bride auction like she's a cow for your farm. So, according to St. Jerome, it was better to be alone with God than in the company of a woman. Guess God is a woman because he was found in bed having an affair with a married one. Oopsies, hypocrite. Do you want to learn more about hypocrisy in the past? Because there's a ton of it. Subscribe to The Hive to see our regularly released history videos. Alrighty, that was a beautiful segue into number nine, the discussion of how women in ancient Rome could be worshipped but never equal. As stated, while Roman society
society may have been dominated by men, their original godly pantheon was anything but. They bowed to powerful women, begging for mercy or pleasure from their female goddesses. Part of the appeal of Christianity was bowing to a woman no longer. They finally became obsolete, powerless. But they were anything but powerless in the era of Roman paganism. Of the three supreme deities worshipped by ancient Romans, only one, Jupiter, the king of gods, was male. The other two were Juno, the chief goddess and protectress of the empire, and Minerva, Jupiter's daughter, the goddess of wisdom and war. The Vestal Virgins, aka priestesses of Vesta, were ranked among the city's most important residents, having been appointed to this role before puberty, remaining chaste for the next 30 years of their lives. These six virginal women held sacred duties like preserving the earth, the hearth fire, and Vesta's temple. As it was believed if the fire died, so would Rome. That's a pretty serious job. They also had the most important duties in the kingdom, such as safeguarding the wills of the wealthiest and most prominent Romans, such as Julius Caesar himself, because women were more trustworthy than men, but they weren't to be trusted. Okay, anyway, the priestesses' religious significance gave them unusual power and influence, and they occasionally used it as when they intervened to save the young Caesar from the dictator Sulla. This worship of women and deifying them into earthly roles such as the Vestals had been the saving grace of women's rights in the horrifically male-centric Roman society. Unfortunately, as said, it was swept away in the name of man. Okay, a break from sad lady facts for number eight. Let's cover warrior women. Yeah, now that's more like it. So, from the northern most tip of the border with Asia, plenty of ancient European armies were happy to welcome women into their ranks. But historians always agree upon one exception where the army and navy were almost 99.9% .9 men. Can you guess who it is from the title of the video? Women may have been banned legally from joining the army, but your average Roman soldier would have seen their fair share of female combatants, as well as their own women on the home front. Professor Valentin J. Belfiglio shared that Roman women were capable of close combat as well. Not only were they frequent competitors in gladiatorial shows, but they, like the women of the clans fighting against the invading Romans, were known to take up arms in warfare, albeit in a non-official, unsanctioned capacity. History tells of a few of these women, such as Cloelia, who in 506 BCE freed herself and 20 others from the Etruscan camp and swam them home through enemy spears. For her courage, the Romans erected a bronze equestrian statue with the heroine seated upon it. Belficlio notes, on the highest point, along the sacred way. When the Carcinian general Hannibal was invading, women and men inhabitants fought valiantly and they burned his siege engines together. Hannibal would later face and lose to the honored Busa, who aided Roman fugitives from his war regime. So in summary, women may have been banned legally from joining the army, but your average Roman soldier would have battled against and sometimes besides women despite that. The name game, it's number seven in the countdown, women like a lazy boy chair an ice maker or owning a cat were possessions in ancient Rome. And so, like the college roommate who complained if you moved their toaster two inches to the left, they put their name on it. Not in a label maker fashion, more so in a recycle fashion. From the moment of their birth, women were viewed under male authority. Therefore, the name of a baby girl would be close to her father's. For example, Claudius may have a daughter named Claudia. Augustus becomes Augusta. Constantine, Constantina. Okay, so maybe the rule was just whatever the last letter was swap it to an A. Ironically, this is why a lot of women's names end with an uh sound. Talk about making historical waves, seeing as our society still inherently perceives names with that ending as sounding feminine. As the empire grew older, women in the ancient Rome were granted more freedom, often by sheer number of children they bore. Three children could allow a woman to become independent. Independence meant no more naming your kids after their dad, which isn't fair anyways because I'm sorry, but who carried this kid for 12 months and then had to push it out? Thus, Daughters started being named after goddesses, their mothers, their aunts, and plants. Anyways, number six, once you were old enough for baby time, you were married off. And when that happened, you donned a stola. In my recent video, the top 10 messed up marriage traditions in ancient Rome, I explained the Roman marriage ceremony and also the garb worn. The flamium was an egg yolk yellow veil worn by brides that they would lift from their face and hair in preparations for vows to instead fall down on their shoulders and biceps. This placement of the veil signifies her donning the stola. The stola was a type of long overlay, sometimes 
sometimes it was in the form of a dress itself, but oftentimes it was an additional soft and light drape of material. It was worn by married and respectable women and was also associated with modesty. For those who could afford it, a stola with decorations around its neckline was available. This trim could be patterns, embroidery, beads, and motifs. When initially introduced, the stola was a preserve for the upper class patrician women in the early republic. But over time, the right and then the absolute expectation to wear it extended to the lower class women. The pala, a rectangular shawl, was also worn over it as a cloak and draped over the left shoulder. Any women who were convicted of adultery or were working girls or actresses were forbidden to wear a stola in public. Part of what dictated the stola, however, was number five, the stupid opium law. So in 215 BC, the Roman men who were overtaxed passed the Opinian Law, named after Gaius Opius, the tribune of the plebeians who instituted it. And it was passed one year after Rome's catastrophic defeat at the hands of the Carthinian general Hannibal. To summarize it in the laziest terms, Opinian Law was initiated by a group of poor people seeking revenge against the wrong source. Instead of trying to coup their government for the taxation, they lashed out at women and their already minimal freedoms. This new Opinion Law limited Roman women's allowance to half an ounce of gold and prohibited them from wearing dresses, multicolored garments, or anything with purple borders as purple dye was very expensive. It also prohibited women from riding in a carriage except on a long journey, pregnant or otherwise. Yes. 20 years after it's imposed, Marcus Fundanius and Lucius Valerius, the tribunes of the people, brought a motion to repeal the Opinion Law. Noblemen came forward hoping to persuade or dissuade them. A crowd of both supporters and opponents filled the Capitoline Hill. The matrons and maids of Rome, whom neither counsel, shame, husband, and father's orders could keep them at home, proceeded to blockade every street in the city and every entrance to the forum. As the men opposed and came down to the forum, the women tried to reason with them to let them too have back the luxuries they'd enjoyed before. The Republic was thriving and that everyone's private wealth has increased with every day. When the speeches for and against the law had been made, even more women poured into the public the next day when the vote was to be cast. Together, they besieged the door of the Brutuses, who were vetoing the decision to repeal the law, and they didn't stop until the tribunes changed their minds. The women of Rome, as a collective, forced the men to repeal their biased law. Number four is a bit of a strange one. It's what's best. Wealthy Roman women didn't believe in breastfeeding their own children. Instead, they handed them over to a wet nurse, usually a prisoner or a hired free woman who was contracted to provide this service. Soranus, the influential author of a second century work on gynecology, prescribed that a wet nurse's milk might be preferable in the days after birth, on the grounds that the mother could become too exhausted to feed. He did not approve of feeding on demand and recommended that solids such as bread soaked in grape juice should be introduced at six months. Soranus Honest, also pointed to the possible benefits of employing Greek wet nurses who could pass on the gift of her mother's tongue to her charge. Did he think that she would be able to give language through breast milk? You know what? Never mind. This flew in the face of advice from most Roman physicians and philosophers who always suggested that mother's milk was the best for both the child and the mother's health and moral character on the grounds that wet nurses may pass on, not kidding, their crappy flaws or personality to the baby. These same men also usually pitched that women who did not feed their own child were lazy, vain, and unnatural, and only cared about possible damages to their figures. The hatred of women was very real. Alright, well, let's get away from the terrible medical beliefs of ancient men, number three will be the OG hair extensions. Historical evidence from Pompeii suggests hairdressing shops, known as torresos, existed. It makes sense. Roman women did have certain hairstyles expected of them based off class or marital status. E.g., unmarried women put their hair up in woolen bands when going out and added a gauzy hair veil to boot. While single women were expected to have their hair up, it doesn't mean it couldn't be styled. They pepper in braids, twists, and curls. More noble or prestigious women could arrange their hair more elaborately in various styles such as long curls and waves. The curls would be made by dipping tongs in fire. Cool, right? But one specifically weird little tidbit is that brunette ginger and raven hair Roman women had a fixation with blonde hair. This interest was caused when Roman warriors brought back captured women from France and Germany and quickly became incorporated into the imagery of their gods and goddesses, who oftentimes had 
dark hair or the more heavenly and revered color of ginger before this point. The Roman ladies would dye their hair blonde with pastes and powders in order to copy the blonde hair of their working girls and captives, but the color would eventually come off as they hadn't figured out the chemical composition to permanently bleach hair yet. To solve this vanity issue, the hair of the blonde working and captive girls was chopped off so Roman women could wear it as wigs. Might as well make number two all about the Roman face mask then. Why? Because it was gross. Just so gross. Y'all ready? Homegirls back in the day made face masks composed of sheep's wool soaked in a soupy paste mixture of animal placenta, excrement, and urine, as well as sulfur, abrasive oyster shells, and bile. Who's bile? God, okay. And this is before you'd whiten your skin. Another trend started by the arrival of the pale French and German captive girls. They did this with lead, dung, and whatever marl is. Want to reduce wrinkles? Get out of Canada or anywhere under the crown because the Roman women would kill swans, which is a crime under British rule, and use their fat. This was all part of Mundus Mulibris, which translated it means women's world, a reference to women's fineries in the ancient Roman world. This would include face and skin care, but also dresses, jewelry, hair care, all described in Latin literature by the famed Cicero, who noted it alongside Mundi Omatam, aka the ordered beauty of the world, and Kale Omatas, celestial adornment. See, there's some non-deprecating writing on Roman ladies. Good job making it over to the very low bar there, Cicero. Seneca, not so much. The depressing dude was quick to blasphemize makeup and say it led to the decline of Rome. And of course, for number one, we will visit Sappho on Lesbos Island. The Greek poet Sappho, who lived from six 30 to 570 BCE lived on the island of Lesbos, just off the west coast of what is now Turkey, and composed poems that live on in infamy to this day. As she speaks very openly about her homoerotic attraction and even implied intercourse amongst women. These poems are mostly written from the perspective of herself as a character. But what did the Greeks and Romans think of this? How could these poems be so widely adored that they're remembered to this date? So, like I've mentioned, men wrote Roman history, so they weren't particularly interested in what women got up to when men weren't around. As a result, we know little about same gender relations of women in Rome, but what we do know is telling. The Greeks and the Romans as a society, of course, recognize that some people are more interested in one gender over another, but the general consensus was not to assume this preference was a fixed aspect of a person's identity. Instead of thinking about gendered attraction in terms of genders a person was attracted to, the Greeks and Romans cared about the role a person took during the act of intercourse with an individual. For some Romans, a same gender relationship between women was the most confusing thing imaginable, as well as a little bit disturbing. They had trouble comprehending the possibilities of the relationship given that neither of those involved a man and could naturally take the male role. Layman's terms, these empires believed the act of intercourse was a free adult man proving his masculinity by dominating the territory of an inferior person. If there was no man involved, then there was no real intercourse happening. Therefore, for women having relations, let alone extramarital affairs with one another, wasn't something men needed to worry about. Number 10, throwing garbage at the bride and groom in Scotland. Scotland's a pretty old country, so they obviously have some old school traditions that have stood the test of time. But one of the weirdest of the bunch revolves around their weddings and how they treat the bride and groom. Just before the holy ceremony is supposed to take place, friends and family of the engaged couple gather together for an old tradition that is known as blackening. Basically what happens here is the friends and family throw all sorts of substances at the bride and groom, including mud and rotten food, to make a real mess before the actual wedding begins. It is believed that this old tradition is supposed to prepare the couple for the tough challenges they will face in their new life together and act as a rite of passage into marriage. While it may seem hard to believe that there is a pre-wedding tradition that could steal the actual ceremony's thunder, this one definitely holds a weird and special place in the hearts of the Scottish people. Number 9. No bathrooms for 3 nights in Indonesia One of the absolute worst feelings in the world is needing to use a bathroom and not being able to find one. The only thing that could be even worse than this is knowing exactly where the bathroom is and not being allowed to use it. While this may sound like some sort of medieval torture method, it is actually an age old ritual in many southern Asian countries such as Indonesia. The marriage tradition states that the bride and groom must be confined to their home for 3 nights and they are not allowed to use the water during this time. The tradition also calls for their family and friends 
to smear the couple in rice, flour, and ash, and they use this as a way to symbolize their transition into a new life together. The families and friends will also keep a close eye on the bride and groom to ensure that they do not cheat and use the washroom or wash the food mixture off of their bodies. The Indonesians believe that the couple enduring this challenging period together 